Uh, my name is uh, Phil Aguilar, A.K. the Chief, A.K. Pastor Phil, A.K. the Real Dr. Phil. I kind of <laughs> called all the above. My old nickname when I was a teenager was Friday. I was like Robinson Crusoe's partner. I was kind of a headhunter, you know, ready to eat somebody. So that was my nickname back in the past. Matter of fact, I still have a belt buckle made by one of my buddies, a guy named Fat Ray Pilts, who was a Hells Angels in the San Diego chapter. And he had a beautiful buckle with Friday put on it. So got a long history back in the biker days. Well, I, you know, as a teenager, I had one of my uncles who lived next door to me. And so he was a biker, you know. So it just happened he was always, you know, building up bikes and doing all this kind of stuff like that. So I was all interested in a motorcycle right off the get-go as a teenager. And then one day he built this matchless motorcycle and I'd do hill climbing and just going riding bikes. So at a young age, I got into uh, liking to ride motorcycles. And then as, as a youngster, you know, I'd heard of one motorcycle club, and that was the Hells Angels. That was the, the most well-known in the world. And there was always an intrigue, kind of like, you know, when you grow up and you see uh, movies like The Godfather or this. And so, you know, not everybody, just a few of us, but we all think about what it would be like to live the mob style, the gangster style, you know, to be a bad guy. It just looked like a cool brotherhood to me, even as a teenager. No, he got me into riding, I was riding dirt bikes with him, yeah. but eventually, like I said, I uh, had somebody, I saw a motorcycle, it was a 57 panhead motorcycle, it had upsweep pipes, old cool, old school, yeah. you know, kickstart, everything like that, it was an old school motorcycle, and so in the late 60s, you know, I was just a pot smoking hippie, but uh, I wanted to get myself a Harley, and I started a crew called The Boys. It was just a group of us fellows, and we just started riding around and causing a little havoc. You know, we were, you know, the bad boys of our neighborhood. We weren't out killing anybody or doing anything like that. We were just, you know, mischievous young characters. So that was going on in my early teenage years of life. Uh, but as I progressed, like I said, eventually, you know, I'm riding a Harley, met other guys, and, you know, I saw people who wear, wear patches, but, uh, you know, I didn't think much about it. Then I got busted for $10 worth of marijuana back in 1968. So um, I was kind of a hippie flower child, motorcycle riding, not too big a trouble guy. But when I went to the county jail for a year, back in the day, a year for $10 worth of weed, which is nowadays people would laugh at it, you know, but uh, at the county jail, I ended up meeting some characters who were a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, cray-cray, if you will. And so, uh, man, when I got out, I started hanging around with some other bikers, you know, and some outlaw bikers. And I have a, a few brothers in the family, and my brothers who are all bikers too. So one of them, Big Bert, he was down at Ocean Beach one day, and uh, he meets this guy. They look at each other, and they look similar, big old guys, you know. And so he brings this guy to my house. And uh, during this time, I started getting a little more into drugs. So I started shooting heroin. I became a heroin addict. And so he brings over this fat Ray to me, who's a sergeant of arms of the San Diego chapter of the Hells Angels. And uh, he brings him over to talk to me about doing drugs. And I'm getting counsel from this Hells Angel about, you know, I shouldn't be doing this heroin. And I'm going, my gosh, I thought these guys were outlaws. And I thought outlaws did any drug they will. I didn't realize that bikers got a code and rules. And so he came over. And then what he did is he took me, uh, my brother and this guy, Fat Ray, they took me to an outlaw run in Omaha, Nebraska. It was called the USA Run. Hells Angels from everywhere there. I mean, there had to be a thousand Hells Angels. And here I am. They let, it's a big deal for them to let me come in to this circle and party with them for a few days. And I'm going, my gosh, this is a, these guys are huge. What a motley crew, you know. And, but I liked a whole lot about their camaraderie. That was the thing that got me, the brotherhood of it, you know, having a good time together, all the fellas, you know, and uh, sticking together. And, 
you know, being notorious, being infamous, all that kind of stuff. My pride, my ego got it. Man, that would be a cool thing to do someday. So that was kind of my first taste of being around the outlaws. And so uh, I ended up uh, giving up the heroin and then started uh, riding and just hanging out at biker bars. So biker bars is what got me going first. And there was a group called the Hessians in Orange County, California that were real big motorcycle club. And so I started hanging out with a bunch of the Hessians. I'm hanging out with Hell's Angels, you know. I'm going, my gosh, what kind of lifestyle have I got myself into? But I was having so much fun. We'd just get drunk. We'd have fights. We'd have a good time. They treated me great. I had a great time with them. And so I'm doing that. And then the next thing you know, I'm busted and locked up. So, uh, you know, I got sent away for a couple of years. Can got a little. Can you, can you say what you got busted for? I got busted for a little drugs and a little bit of violence. Um, I got a one to 10 year sentence. And in those days, you had what was called indeterminating sentences. That meant you had to go before the parole board every year, see if they're going to give you a date. Well, when I got in, I was at Chino State Prison. And little did I know that what happened is I went to a chapel service there. And, uh, you know, I, I really wasn't into God, but I heard this preacher. And, man, I did it at Chino State Prison. And back in 1977, uh, I dedicated my life to God. Now, I didn't know what all that meant, but here I am. I'm in prison, but the people, you got to run with your own crew. In other words, I had to run with my own race, you know, my own people. And I'd see bikers over there who were white bikers, but those were the guys I'd run with on the street, just white bikers, the majority of them. And so in there, I started realizing, you know, the whole lifestyle you had to live. But when I got introduced to God in there, I, I was serious. I mean, I was serious. So I started a gang called God's Gang. And I had a crew of us that were believers, but we were ready to kick ass. We were ready to, you know, fight because I was a young, carnal, fleshly Christian. I didn't realize you're supposed to, not, you know, be nice to everybody. I just knew that I'm going to get this relationship going with God. I was going to follow Jesus, do what he did. So I spent the next couple of years studying the Bible, just boom, boom, boom. I get released from prison. And next thing you know, I end up going to a church. I end up going to a Bible college. And uh, next thing you know, in 1982, I started a church called Set Free. Started in a buddy of mine's house. We rented a little small spot. Next thing you know, I got a warehouse in downtown Anaheim. And uh, man, because I was a biker before, I got myself a Harley. So here I am back in those days, long haired, tattooed up, Harley riding pastor, which was very novel in 1982. So here I am like that. And so I had somebody from the congregation bought me a Harley. And so, man, I started a motorcycle ministry and we called our first motorcycle ministry Christ Sons. It said Christ Sons, live or die. There's still a whole group of Christ Sons motorcyclists from the group that I started. They're still rolling today. Great group of people. So we started that off and that was back in the days before it was cool to be a Christian biker, you know? So we're doing that and we're going on runs all over the place. We run into a group called the Vagos. And I run into a guy named Terry the Tramp who was the international president for 26 years of the Vagos. And we hit it off. For some reason in my life, I was always attracted and always hooked up with all the shot callers of every crew. It just happened that way, you know? You just, birds of a feather, flock together. So here I am. I'm hanging out with these characters, but I'm a Christian. I got a group going on, but we're kind of getting to be known as, hey, those are Christians, but don't mess with them. Or they'll beat your ass. And that wasn't true, you know, but the, most of the guys that were part of my crew were all ex-cons, this and that. And uh, then the next thing, you know, uh, we decided to change the name of our club to Servants for Christ. And the patch we had before was uh, yellow and red and gold. This one was a black and white patch called Servants for Christ. And I'm just telling you, the church just took off because I had this a guy and girl uh, named Paul and Jan Crouch. They had a TV program called Trinity, Broad Trinity Broadcasting Network. And they had a show called The Praise the Lord Show. And so these people love what I did because I took people off the streets. I had a couple hundred people living in our homes. 
I had a biker group, feeding people, you know, getting people off of drugs. So they love what we do. So they came to see me, invited me on the program. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm a dirty biker for Jesus who's helping people. And so they want to help me out. So here, because I'm on TV now, uh, on this program, people wanted to join in. So next thing you know, our club grew to over 125 Servant for Christ motorcycle members. So now... People took notice in the outlaw world. Hell's Angels took notice. Matter of fact, one of the guys who used to hang out with us at Separate Church was a guy they called Big Rusty. He's Quinn from the Sons of Anarchy show. But uh, he became one of my good friends at church, stuff like that. He's still a good friend of mine. I did his wedding for him and his wife when he was locked up. But uh, so I got all kinds of characters who were riding with me then who are now Mongols, now Vagos, they got into outlaw clubs, but they used to be part of our Christian ministries. Set Priests produced so many Christian ministries. Matter of fact, almost every Christian motorcycle club now had their roots started our Set Free Church. So now we got over 125 members of our Servants for Christ. But when you're riding in a pack like that, I didn't know some of the, the common things you're supposed to do when you're in the biker world. I was always breaking the rules. I, was, I, I figured, hey, I'm not going to ask questions. I'll just ask for forgiveness later. That was kind of my lifestyle, you know. I had a ministry in my mind called Catch Me If You Can Ministry. And so we'd pull into these events and two Larry bike runs, different places we'd go to. And I'd have Terry the Tramp and these guys, he'd go, man, you can't be, you know, rolling in with that many people together. And when you stroll around, the, you know, the event, make sure just four at a time. And just like I told you, I was still shocked earlier that you could only do certain drugs if you're a biker, you know. All these little codes of the biker world, I had to realize, hey, you know, got to behave in certain areas like that. But we just developed a big Christian motorcycle crew. And the majority of them were ex-cons, ex-dope fiends, all this stuff like that. <clears throat> but we were riding for Jesus. And it was just a, a great thing, like I says. And I was doing a big church and all that kind of stuff. And then the next thing you know, I go to start a place called the Dream Center in Los Angeles, California, which is a big inner city mission project up there. So I'm working with all kinds of gangbangers and all this stuff. And here our bikers are still reaching out because bikers have a way of coming in. We're like the original outlaws of the land, you know, kind of like the cowboys were back in the day, oh, the cowboys and Indians and all that kind of stuff. So bikers, we'd pull into every neighborhood, any gang neighborhood, and they'd always show respect and love for us. But our whole point was, is we were undercover going to talk about Jesus. That was our thing. So that was going great and everything like that, helping out, doing ministries and everything like that. But uh, then I came back to Orange County over here and uh, got this bright idea that we were going to start another club, change the name again. And this was around 2003. Uh, we decided to start a group called the Set free soldiers. Now the set free soldiers, what made that different than any other clubs is I wanted a green beret type outfit. I wanted a, you know, a Navy SEALs type. I wanted those above and beyond the call of duty. I was just uh, one of those places in my life where, man, I want a hardcore, the hard I want a, a bike club for Jesus, man, you know, that just, uh, man, everybody goes, who are those guys? That type of thing. So we started that around 2003, 2004. And uh, we got ourselves black and white patches. Matter of fact, set free soldiers on them. And the rules were everybody had to have a black Harley Davidson, all black. And it had to be a Dyna model, an FX model, because we just wanted to ride fast, ride hard. You know, the old biker saying, ride hard, die young, a good looking corpse, you know. Uh, we die as, but you can see that didn't work out that well, you know. So it was all that type of thinking. We got together there. We were looking good. And I mean, you know, it was a good looking crew and we had our chase trucks and we had our patches going like that and we had stickers and we had a website on MySpace and then we had videos going up of all of us riding. And before you know it, there's this drug that was my hardest one to always kick and it was called the pride drug, you know, because I started to become a legend in my own mind. You know, I pull into a place and, you know, people say, well, this is their area or they're that area. And I go, hey, ain't nobody tell me where I can go. And this is as a Christian. This is, is a pastor. This is, is a, you know, a more than middle-aged man, you know, with a lot of kids, a lot of grandkids. 
Well, with your crew, when you're ro riding and rolling with a good looking crew like that and you're going in and you pull into places in the Red Sea parts and you know, and the shot callers from you know, every outlaw motorcycle club is giving you love and respect and you're, except they're asking you to do funerals and weddings and come over here and help my brother off of drugs. I mean, man, my whole world like, was like that, you know? I affiliated, you know, uh, you know, your vibe attracts your tribe. So at my houses and our clubhouses, I would be having all these notorious 10 most wanted from the FBI character hanging out of my house. And my hidden thing underneath was I just want to share the love of Jesus with them. And so I wanted to rub off on them, but some of them rubbed off on me too at the same time. So here I am, 2005, 2005 soldiers are doing great. We're riding down the highways of Southern California. We're heading out to Vegas, going to every bike club meeting, every event. We're all over the places. And, um, you know, I found out in any world, sometimes there's jealous lovers. Sometimes people, you know, they see you got this color on, that color. And a lot of times people thought because we had a black and white pass that maybe we were belong to another club, but we were our own crew. We were a Christian motorcycle club, not a gang. And the next thing that happens is uh, I get this bright idea, like I says, that, man, we need to do a reality show on the Set Free Soldiers. So one of my producer, Hollywood producer friends, a guy named Clay from down in Venice Beach, he gets his big money producers come in over here. Dog the Bounty Hunter had just lost their spot on A&E. And so the producer's guys goes, hey, man, we can get you on that spot. And I'm going, well, we can get on there. So we started a show called Saint or Sinner. And it was watching a group of bikers roll around, show how we run our rehab home, show how we do our counseling, show how we try to keep safe, protect people, all that kind of stuff. We stood, they gave us a budget of almost a half a million dollars to do a pilot on, and it was cool as can be. But I didn't realize, well, we're doing all this, thinking we're doing all this good stuff, looking cool, looking bad, and all that kind of stuff. The popo, the police, every time we went to an outlaw event, were taping us, shooting us, filming us, going, who are these Christian guys? They hang around with these guys, they hang around with these they must be, they walk like a duck, they talk like a duck, maybe they are a duck, where there's smoke, they must be, you know how, especially in the popo, they're looking at that stuff, but we were just a bunch of fun-loving, hardcore bikers for Jesus, and that was our whole mission, Jesus, but it didn't look like that from the outside, we had all our vehicles, all soldier heads all over like that, we were looking bad, man, I mean, we were looking bad to the bone, people from all over wanted to join our crew, and it was a elite group, we only took so many, so here we are, shooting these videos, riding around everywhere like we own the place, you know, not being wise as a serpent at all, you know. We were just uh, kind of flaunting our stuff, flossing our stuff, poking the bear in the eye type of lifestyle of living. So we're putting all this together. We're getting all this ready, you know, uh, for our TV show. Uh, little did I know that the police, the detectives from all over Orange County, they were looking at us like we were the sons of anarchy. Sons of Anarchy hadn't even came on the scene yet. But to them, that's who they thought we were. Man, these bikers, they probably got a prostitution ring going on. They probably got all kinds of weapons. They got this, that, boom, boom. Oh, my gosh, talk about, it. you know. I didn't know that, though. I'm riding around thinking everything's cool. Ah, it's pretty dumb. Pride will make you blind. Pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before the fall. How the mighty have fallen. You know, you check out Samson's life and all the other fools like that, you know, and they get distracted. King David got distracted. Well, the chief, Dr. Phil, Pastor Phil got distracted and was enjoying the fame, the infamy of uh, just, you know, you know, big fish in a little pond. So one day, 2008, Sunday afternoon, I decided I'm going to take our crew on the beach run. So we got about 16 of us, not a big group, but we look like we were hundreds of us. Tight, good brotherhood, good friend, beautiful looking bikes, beautiful looking chase trucks. I mean, we were looking good. And so uh, during that time, one thing I'll add to it, to, just to add to the biker lifestyle, the biker scene, uh, we bought a bar, Tiki Club, Costa Mesa, Newport Beach area over there. So now we're a Christian club with a bar, you know, nicest bikes around, all this flaunting our stuff, flossing our stuff, riding around. Everybody's talking about us. 
I thought it was all in a good way, but not everybody like that. The popo, the police, the ATF, DA going, these guys must be doing weapons, prostitution, drugs. You know, they didn't realize that wasn't us, but we did look like it. And when I look back now, I can go, that's a pretty scandalous looking group of characters, you know, a little rough around the edges. You know, I don't know about this Christian thing either I, when I look back at it, but during the time, you know, it's kind of like my friends that live in a city called Norco. Norco is a cow town. It's a horse town. When I go visit my friends over there, Smoking Joe and guys over there, I go, Smoking Joe, man, it smells like dog shit around. It smells like crap around here, you know? And he, and you know what he tells me? I don't smell anything. You see, when you're living in it, you don't smell it. And I was living in my own poop, and I didn't smell it. So here, after we got the bar, we got this, boom. So I just say, take my beach run, and uh, here I am, I go down there, and I go to a place called Blackie's Bar, Newport Beach. Not a biker bar, but Blackie's Bar. Going into bar, going to shoot some pool. About 16 of us guys there, and, um, you know, all of a sudden, our guys go to get something to eat. They go, and five of us go walking into this bar. I can remember it like it was yesterday, but it was 12 years ago now. Walked into the bar and started walking the back. It's July. It's hot out like that. So I take my cut off, my vest, put it on a bar stool, and uh, we order something to drink right there. And uh, the reason I say that is because when I got arrested, they said when I took off the vest, that meant I was ready, and these are their words, the detectives in court. He was getting ready to rumble. They use that old term. Taking this up, getting ready to run, run rumble. There's cameras in this bar, and they captured me on camera walking outside, going on the phone, calling my wife to tell her, hey, I'm over here in Newport. We'll be home in a few hours. But they said I was calling for uh, recruits to get ready to do some damage. Here I am, all of a sudden, some fellows came in from an outlaw club. Next thing you know, I had a hang around there with me, and a hang around means they're not seasoned, you know, they haven't been tried and tested, of what a good guy they are. And, um, and like I said, and they, they don't know how to keep their mouth shut sometimes. So somebody came in there and said something, just hang around, said something. Next thing you know, conflict happens. Here I am, Pastor Phil, Dr. Phil, the chief, you know, El Friday. I'm over here in a biker, in, in a bar, excuse me, in a bar, Newport Beach, right by the pier, nice area and everything like that, involved in a fight in a bar. Oh, my God. Next thing you know, the police are there, and here's Pastor Phil, Biker Phil, whatever, boom. And they go, who were the guys? I don't know. Some fellows came in there. It's trouble. You know, it's all over. It's all cool. So they let us go. Thank God. Unfortunate day. Boom. You know, little did I even think that everything was uncaptured on, on video in the, in the bar, stuff like that. So I go home, man, you know, and I'm going, oh, my gosh. This is not good. You know, had a little meeting with the fellows, stuff like that. I go, this isn't our life. That's not what we're all about. And tried to chill out. Two weeks later, you know, uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning, in the house we're in right now, 12 years ago, flash grenades go off at my front door. I had four houses on this block at the time. They had surrounded the whole neighborhood, hundreds of ATF, DEA, five city police departments. Anaheim has a tank that was in my front over here. Helicopters, this, news stations, everything. It was a plan set up because an unidentified informant, you know who they are, whoever they are, uh, had told them that we were armed heavily and we would have a standoff. There's no way that they're going to take us in. And so they came, boom, uh, when I heard that flash gun, I look out the window, and there was red dots on every one of our houses next door, down the street, everything like that. M16s pointed at us from everywhere, and it was not good. It was not good. And I'm wondering what happened, you know, because our incident happened a couple weeks before, but because of that, that incident, they figured maybe we are all those things that they thought we were, 
So the judge ordered, you know, a uh, search warrant for us that they could do what they were doing. But the news stations, everybody was here, so they'd all planned it. It's a big thing. Christian pastor, biker, conflict with Outlaw Motorcycle Club, you know, boom, all this stuff. They came over here, and they just, boy, next-door neighbors, my grandkids, my sons, family members, soldiers in our group all lived around here on this block. They arrested. They took nine of us in. They had my wife in the paddy wagon. I mean, they had my kids out in the front. It was an ugly scene. It was a traumatic scene. It was a horrible scene. I mean, you know, you know the loudspeakers, Aguilar, come out with your hands up. You know, the whole route, it was a... Uh, it was a very heavy-duty day, and I wasn't sure exactly uh, what they wanted. wasn't sure exactly what it was all about, because I had 30 years clean since I got out of uh, parole from prison. You know, I had 30 years clean, everything was going good, never been in any kind of altercation with anybody, a peacemaker, friends with everybody, trying to get along with everybody. But uh, like I shared with people, and I said earlier, pride goes before the fall. Next thing you know, boom, I'm on my way to the police station. The detectives are saying, you're never getting out, Aguilar. This is it. You're done. We've been looking for you. We've had informants. We've been taking pictures of you at every bike run you've been to. We know who you hang out with, like I says, and we're going to get your computers, see all the prostitution ring stuff you have on there. We're going to dig up, go through everything here, find out all your weapons, you know, we're going to find your drugs, all that kind of stuff. I've been drug-free for 40 years. You know, that's never been part of my life again. But they didn't think so. And like I said, when I look back, on it, we did kind of resemble, uh, you know, kind of um, a crazy hazardous element of characters. So here I go down to Anaheim City Jail, and all of a sudden I'm seeing eight of my other soldiers over there. And uh, they got us in there, and so boom, they, you know, try to get some information from us. We don't know nothing, you know. And then they give us a sheet that tells you what you're arrested for. And we're arrested for attempted murder, you know, um, street terrorism, uh, gang this. I mean, you know, all these charges and gave us a nice million dollar bail. So, you know, I got some bail bonds friends. Know, they know what that's like, you know. So here I was in a million dollar bail going, oh my gosh. And all of a sudden it was a wake up call, a great wake up call. And I'm one of those guys, you know, go big or go home. I learned the hard way. The first scripture verse I learned from the Bible is, can a man take fire into his bosom and not get burnt? And my first thought was, how burnt will I get? So I was always pushing the envelope anyway and all this stuff. So here I am, that million dollar bail. I was 60 years old. Wasn't a youngster, you know. I thought they'd have some sympathy on a grandfather, you know, senior citizen. They didn't care about that BS, you know. It was Aguilar, you're going down for the count now. We got you. So next thing you know, they roll us over to the loop at Orange County Jail. And as they're putting us from cell to cell over there, they're putting up our videos, all our cool biker videos in Mexico, Vegas, all over, you know. They're putting them up on all the screens in the jailhouse for everybody to watch. You know, and they're just happy as can be. We busted the set free soldiers. We got you now. You're down for life. You're never getting out. Boom, boom, boom. And so I spent three days before I got bailed out in the county jail there. And there's a story in the Bible about Jonah and the whale's belly. And Jonah was in there for three days. Well, I was in this whale's belly three days. And uh, I can remember talking to my head uh, guy in my club. I says, hey, I let us into this, and I'm going to lead us out of this. Because I found out everything rises and falls on leadership. I couldn't blame anybody. I'm the leader of this club. I started this club. I started Set Free. I'm taking full responsibility. God, first I was going, why, Lord? And uh, within a minute, God says, it's not about why. Here's what I'm going to teach you. He says, uh, you were getting a little cray-cray, getting a little out there. You are getting a little, you know, it wasn't good. Your future didn't look good. And so I love you, so I had to get your attention. And I got it big. Biggest raid in Orange County history over here. I mean, it was huge. And so I go, okay, God, I got it. So I get uh, bailed out back over here. They tore this place to bits. This house was torn, the attics, this, that. They dug up the backyard looking for drugs. There was no drugs. There was no weapons. There was no prostitution. There was none of that stuff. They'd been uh, taking these uh, classes where you learn about biker gangs 
and thought we were the sons of anarchy yet that hadn't arrived on TV yet. And they just thought all that stuff. So here I am, now I'm going to court. And uh, they dropped the charges against everybody but my son-in-law and my son that lives next door because they know how to put pressure on it. They're just going to get my family. Are they going to do all this stuff? And the detectives are, you know, over there laughing before we go into court. We got you. You're done. This and that. And uh, what could I do? But like I said, just trust the Lord. Just trust the Lord. So here we get in there. When they did their search, they found one thing in my house. I had a vase of us sitting in my dresser. Put all my change in it, coins, rings, thing, put it in whatever, whatever is in my pipe, put, put it in this little thing. Little did I know a few years back what I'd put in there was a bullet. I don't even know what the bullet was to. It's just a bullet. Somehow it ended up there. And I found out when you're an ex-con, when you're an ex-felon, that bullet is called ammunition, and it's a grade A felony worthy of violation. You know, and I'd already had two strikes, two felonies before, so they could even mess with me just on that stinking bullet. They tried everything. They couldn't everything like that. Finally, like it says, and I believe it was totally God, you know, God gave grace. And uh, they, they had to drop the charges and realize, you know, there's no weapons, nothing like that, no drugs, anything like that. So thank God, got released from that. But before I got released from that, because that took two years fighting that, two years, before I got released from that, the, the, the biggest hate mail I got was from my Christian family. You know, Pastor Phil, what were you doing in the bar? What were you doing there? How come you did that? How come you're fighting with somebody? You know? And, uh, and it was the news blew up our computers because people from all over the world that knew about our ministry were writing in, hey, what happened? How come this happened, this like that? It was on every news station. It was all over the place. So uh, I, I, I ended up, you know, the, the technical people, you know, told me it went on over a million sites on the Internet, you know, talking about uh, Christians involved in a fight, in a bar, you know, arrested, million-dollar bail, outlaws, what are they? Is he really a pastor? Is he a cult leader? I mean, you name it, it was said about me. And uh, it was a troubling, hard time. But since the day I got released from jail, this is what's cool about the whole story. It's been 12 years, and every day, you know, I had to, you know, it's like I work with addicts, and I, and I tell them, the only thing you've got to change about your life is everything because it's lifestyle so since the day i got out 12 years ago every time i hear a harley ride by it man i got excitement in my bones because that's my life that's the thunder that's the music that's the opera that i love to hear and whenever you've ever ridden with a group of guys a club of guys and you're riding down the highway there and you're just going my gosh this is awesome when that's a, some thrill you've had in your life for you know 40 years and all of a sudden I'm on bail now. I got to get out and straighten this all out. I got to work out a whole new lifestyle. You know, I had to detox from going to events, biker events, outlaw events, this kind of event, everywhere, pulling in, you know, posting up, you know, kind of mad dogging once in a while. I had to give up all of that. And for the last 12 years, every step that I've taken has been forward, not to the side, not to the left or right. It's been forward. And on top of everything else, God had me start a ministry called uh, the Forgiveness Ministry. He wanted me to get my head in such a good place that I wouldn't be upset with the cops that locked me up, that I wouldn't be upset with people we got an altercation with, that I wouldn't be upset with anybody. And I decided to become a professional forgiver. In these last 12 years, man, that's made my mindset wonderful. That's made my life wonderful. This house, you're in this house right now, has been totally, by one of the addicts helped, helped out, rebuilt, remodeled this whole house that they tore apart. Everything's better than ever. But it all started, like I said, that wake-up call 12 years ago, 2008, right here at downtown beautiful Anaheim. You know, God got my attention. He said, son, I just wanted to tell you how much I love you. And you weren't listening, you know, because I started the lame excuse when I first got out of jail, I said I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. That's a good story. But God says, did you see the flashing red lights I put in your head? Did you remember the do not enter signs I put in your head? Detour this way, trouble ahead, do not. 
I had plenty of warnings. I knew, but my pride, once again, you know, I'll ask for forgiveness later. Well, I did ask for forgiveness later, but these last 12 years wouldn't change it for anything. And right now, like I says, at the young age of 72, man, I'm working on projects, just finishing up a book, doing another documentary, and loving on everybody. I don't care what biker club, everything like Last week, we rode to a Set Free Nationals. You know, I got a few of my Christian brothers. We rode out there. We got Set Free bikers all over the place, just celebrating our ministry that is all back and going again. But, boy, 12 years ago, like I says, when that bail, when I read that, when I saw where I was locked up, and just even knowing that I would have anything to do with anything of violence or anything like anybody else, I said, man, totally a healing took place. And so I just want to finish my course, finish doing the good fight of faith and loving on people, telling people about Jesus, and just riding for the Lord. And people go, well, you, like you asked earlier, are you still with that club doing that? I'm in a one-member club now. I got a patch that says, Train to Serve Jesus on, you know? And there's one member because I found out I can't keep an eye on everybody else. I'm enough to keep an eye on. So I know if anybody in my club now pulls any stuff, I know who the guy was. You know, I got to watch out for that guy. I see him in the mirror every morning. He's the character I got to watch out for. So uh, that's kind of my story. Brings you up to date uh, what I'm doing. And like I says, uh, writing books, working on videos, doing some music stuff, still starting set free churches and loving on people. Oh, that's a short version of it, you know. 